Leslie Cornwell, Certified Nurse Midwife with Midwifery Business Consultation. I have with me Amber Price. She's a nurse midwife that has a really unique position, and I've been following her for a while. Um, I listened to her Journey to Midwifery podcast with Amber Wilson and found it very interesting. So I asked Amber if she would join me on my podcast YouTube channel to learn about her midwifery journey and how she's taken this unique approach to help out moms and babies. So thank you, Amber, for being here. You're welcome. Happy to be here. Yeah. So Amber, tell me about your midwifery journey and how you got to where you're at now. Well, uh, like many midwives, I always knew I wanted to be a midwife. Um, you know, I've been at working in women's health in some capacity since 1988. Um, so I've been doing this for quite a long time. Um, I was a military spouse, so we traveled a lot. So I started as a volunteer, as a doula. Um, then became a medical assistant uh, so that I could work, um, you know, actually more formal as we as we moved places. Uh, eventually became a nurse, started as a NICU nurse, then a labor and delivery nurse, uh, moved on to becoming a certified nurse midwife. Um, felt that I was not, um, you know, in the United States, uh, you know, I'm from Holland originally. So mm -hmm. the United States birth culture is very different than other cultures. So I really wanted to learn more about other cultures. So I practiced in New Zealand. Um, and then, you know, being a military spouse, we moved all over the world. So I've, I've had the opportunity to see births in different nations. Um, and just over time, really fell in love with the build of infrastructure. All of those things that it takes to make sure that people get phenomenal care, uh, particularly in rural areas or underserved areas where maternal and neonatal mortality are absolutely rampant and where access to care is incredibly difficult and access to kind, respectful care. So I've been speaking on respectful maternity care um, and everything that comes along with that for many, many years. Um, eventually ended up in academia, uh, teaching in the School of Medicine, um, and then got a doctorate in change leadership, a DMP from Johns Hopkins. Um, got tapped by HCA, a Healthcare Corporation of America, to, to move and help build a women's hospital and take the lead there. Um, and from there, I've worked my way up through uh, all of those things uh, that got me to CEO. Uh, I'm right now the CEO of a regional medical center in Williamsburg, Virginia. Um, and I get to take care of a region, including all of those underserved patients and really kind of put my stamp on what care needs to look like, not just for moms and babies, but for everyone who walks in the building. Well, I find it very interesting. You have such an extensive background in so many different experiences. What made you feel like becoming a CEO, the, li the largest leadership role in a hospital gave you the biggest impact to help those moms and babies out? Well, the thing is that I never thought I was going to be a CEO. I was just going to be a midwife and have dreads and just, you know, go do home birth because I started in home birth. Yeah. Um, so my philosophy of care has not changed. But what it sits in is, is a true belief that everyone who encounters the healthcare system has the right to autonomy and individualized care. Um, and so that translates well throughout the entire healthcare system. And if you've seen me speak in other places, you know that one of the things I'll say over and over is there's no CEO of OB. There's only CEO of the whole hospital. So my philosophy of care, um, of truly believing that people have a voice in their care and deserve respect, uh, translates to every patient who comes in the building. Um, when it comes to moms and babies, it truly is prioritizing the service line. Traditionally in healthcare, women and children is an afterthought. It is not a primary um, or focused service line for an organization, so I put mine in the spotlight because that's the entry point for most women into healthcare. It's where people are incredibly vulnerable and at risk, um, but it also sets the tone for who we are as an organization by prioritizing yeah. those. Well, and I think midwives in the OB sector see that, but we always have a hard time communicating that to leadership because I think a lot of times surgery, they see in the forefront the numbers of the finances, the insurance reimbursement, and OB and mental health is not the insurance reimbursement, but like you said, it's the family. If they're normal and healthy and this is their first exposure to the healthcare system, they're going to stick with what treated them well the rest of their lives for an organization. Mm -hmm. Right. Women make 80% of healthcare decisions. Yeah. We're, we're not prioritized as a service line. Um, and in healthcare leadership, only 14% of hospital CEOs are women. So they're not at the table making decisions in healthcare that actually help connect us to patients. Women um, are different consumers than men in healthcare. Uh, they have different needs. They have different presentations. Um, we think differently. Uh, we prioritize differently. And we absolutely lead differently. Um, and I talk about this all the time, right? That 
all these principles that were taught about leadership tend to apply to men, not women, um, and that we really need to individualize the way we lead as well. Yeah. And that was going to be my next question is how do you, when you're kind of a minority after minority, do you get questions of your credibility because you're a nurse midwife background versus, yes, you've had um, extensive background and so much, but a majority of what you described is in the OB. Like they say, well, how do you know how to handle ER? How do you know how to relate to med surge? How do you know how to relate to these other departments? Well, I'm fortunate in that I have a decade of uh, phenomenal experience um, yeah, and the positions that come with that to back me up. So it's a pretty okay. clear trajectory to CEO, which you know involves an internship and a vice presidency and then a associate okay. administrator, a chief operating officer, and I've done mm -hmm. all those things. So my competence is not so much questioned, but I do get a lot of raised eyebrows, not so much about the fact that I'm a nurse midwife, but about the fact that I'm a woman. Um, mm -hmm. That is in this industry still unusual. Um, I do get questions sometimes uh, about the nurse midwifery component, but I will tell you that overwhelmingly uh, people appreciate, physicians in particular appreciate my clinical background. I speak yeah. their language. I've been in a position where I've had to you know, run a practice. I've been in a position where I saw 30 patients and then I needed things to go smoothly when I got to the hospital and things needed to be in place because otherwise my whole day is ruined. Um, I know what it's like if you can't find the gloves that you need, right? I know. Um, you can I know relate like to the bedside. Mm -hmm. I know what it's like to give phenomenal care and then have somebody complain about you. Um, I know what it's like to be present uh, at a code. I actually come in uh, for some of the codes here. I came in for one two weeks ago um, in labor and delivery and stayed with the staff. Right? I tend to be much more hands-on, very comfortable in the clinical space. Um, that is absolutely appreciated. Uh, That's yeah, a very un unusual aspect, but yeah, you think, because I think a lot of times we see administration is so hard to relate to the boots on the ground bedside and to have more administrators that can really relate to every layer of the system is really helpful. Yeah, um, so I, I don't think that that has held me back. Um, although I will say early on in my career where you're challenged more as you go up the ranks right now, you know, there's not that component any longer, but at, along the way, I was certainly challenged. Um, how can a nurse midwife do this? I will say I've got lots of emails and questions in my day of how on earth do you get from nurse midwife to CEO? And the mm -hmm. answer I always have to that is, you know, my boss was a transporter. Nobody asks him how he got from transporter to CEO. Mm -hmm. um, it's just an interesting thing. It, it's, it's a woman thing and it's a nurse thing um, yeah. that takes people aback. Yeah. But well, I think it's amazing. What's that. your future? Yeah, I was gonna say, what's your future entail? I mean, you've got all these wonderful things. What do you what do you have next on your goal uh, dream? Well, it's interesting because I didn't set out to do this job. Um, yeah. You know, it, it's you find out what you love and what you're good at. Um, you know, and it sits in an advocacy. It sits in you know, having to, you have to understand as you move up the ranks why you're doing it. And for me, that's impact. Right. I need to have a daily impact. Um, or I get bored, I need a big job and I need impact. Yeah. So this will have a natural progression. Um, most likely, um, you know, from CEO up, you either move to bigger hospitals or, you, you know, regional leadership or, or corporate leadership. Um, I know that where I'm happiest is actually in the building. Um, I like being where the, where the clinical care is taking place, where I can build the infrastructure um, that safeguards patients um, because I like to see the impact in person. Well, and I think reinforcing not so much thinking what job, but knowing your passion, you you reinforce three times infrastructure, you like to set up the systems, you like big scale. Correct. And I think that is a very key thing of midwives and, and, and women in general and leadership roles like they like, like, yes, we can catch a baby. One thing that shifted me in 2017 was yes, I can impact this one woman's amazing birth, but I want to impact the whole community, the whole country, the whole world, not just this one woman. Um, and so that's where I shifted gears of more of leadership and bigger systems. I think as you become a midwife and you evolve, you start to learn who you are. Obviously, when I was 16 and probably when you first decided to be a midwife, you were a very different person and you kind of learn in time what type of midwife you want to be. And it's not just always the traditional. And that's the whole point to hit home is there's so many amazing ways that people can be midwives or advocating for women's health care in all these wonderful roles. Yeah, I mean, I'll tell you one of the hardest things I've ever done is step away from the bedside as a midwife. I absolutely loved being a midwife. I loved being with women one on one. My hands itched for months after I stopped, uh, you know, attending births. But, you know, Jenny Joseph, um, 
has a great line, right, in saying that sometimes you have to step away from the perineum to be most effective and mm -hmm. trust others to do that. Um, if you can be effective in building the infrastructure um, that, that makes things better for 100,000 people, then take that opportunity. It's just a very difficult thing to do. And I practiced clinically all the way through being a hospital leader until it got to this place where people actually had to stop me and say, you cannot do this anymore. It's becoming a conflict of interest. You're tired, you're exhausted. Um, you have to make a decision on what you wanna do. And I made that decision. I don't regret it for a moment. Um, I'm glad I did it as long as I did. Um, but yeah, that, that is correct. You have to you know, throw yourself in where you're most effective and where you have the greatest impact. And for me, that was uh, healthcare leadership. So I would love, I always end the tail end of these, what is your advice for anyone that's thinking about becoming a midwife or really a woman leadership role and they're finding hurdles, they're finding challenges, even though they know in their gut, this is what they want to do. What advice would you have for them? Well, I advise people to become midwives because it's, it's in their heart and it's their passion. This is not a job that you're going to be real happy in if you just think it's going to be, you know, be a promotion. Yeah. For it's not, yeah, it's not the money maker. It's not that people don't go it's into it. I mean, sure, those are the obstetricians. That's the divider between midwives and obstetricians. You like to do surgery. You like to have the higher income level versus at the bedside with normal women. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure that I would agree with that either, right? Okay. So you know, I, I get such a, a view of how physicians think and work um, and how they came to be where they okay. are in birth. Um, so I, there might be a whole nother discussion one day. Right. It's kind of my perception of the average OB today and what drives them and why they do what they do. Okay. But um, yeah, I, you know, I think that you come into the profession for the passion that comes with it. Um, if you feel yourself being called to leadership, Remember why you do that, right? If you keep that in mind as you move up the ranks, if it's always about the person or about the infrastructure or about improving, you'll be successful at it. Um, one of the principles of change leadership that I always leave people with is once you start, don't stop. Um, don't back paddle, no matter what comes at you, stick with it and keep going um, and keep in mind why you're doing it. Uh, always keep your focus on the mom and the baby at the end um, and you'll be doing the right thing. Oh, well, thank you so much for your valuable time today, Amber. I'm sure you have lots of meetings today, so thank you. <laughs> You're very welcome.